Section 16 of Anecdotes of Dogs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anecdotes of Dogs by Edward Jesse. Chapter 16 The Terrier, Part 2. The following fact will serve to prove that dogs are capable of gratitude in no ordinary degree. A surgeon at Dover, seeing a terrier in the street which had received some injury, took it home, and having cured it in a couple of days, let it go. For many weeks the grateful animal used to pay him a daily visit of a few minutes, and after a vehement wagging of his tail, scampered off again to his own home. A neighbor of mine has a terrier which has shown many odd peculiarities in his habits. He has contracted a great friendship for a white cat, and evinced his affection for it the other day in a curious manner. The dog was observed to scratch a large, deep hole in the garden. When he had finished, he sought out the cat, dragged her by the neck to the hole, endeavored to place her in it, and to cover her with the soil. The cat, not liking this proceeding, at last made her escape. While two terriers were hunting together in a wood, one was caught by the leg in a trap set for foxes. His companion, finding that he could not extricate the other, ran to the house of his owner, and by his significant gesticulations induced him to follow, and by this means he was extricated. Mr. Morritt, well known to the readers of the life of Sir Walter Scott as his intimate and confidential friend, had two terriers of the pepper and mustard breed, or rather as we prefer him to any other character Sir Walter Scott has delighted us with, the dandy Dimmont breed. These dogs, for we avoid the feminine appellation when we can, were strongly attached to their excellent master and he to them. They were mother and daughter and each produced a litter of puppies about the same time. Mr. Morritt was seriously ill at this period and confined to his bed. Fond as these dogs were of their puppies, they had an equal affection for their master, and in order to prove to him that such was the case, they adopted the following expedient. They conveyed their two litters of puppies to one place and while one of the mothers remained to suckle and take care of them, the other went into Mr. Morritt's bedroom and continued there from morning until the evening. When the evening arrived, she went and relieved the other dog, who then came into the bedroom and remained quietly all night by the side of the bed, and this they continued to do day after day in succession. This charming anecdote was communicated to me from a quarter which cannot leave a doubt of its authenticity, and affords an affecting proof of gratitude and love in animals towards those who have treated them with kindness and made them their friends. Such an anecdote as this should be sufficient to preserve dogs from much of the ill treatment they meet with. I knew a very clever terrier belonging to a friend of mine. His name was Snap. Now Snap, one fine hot summer's day, accompanied his master, who was on horseback, on his way from London to the neighborhood of Windsor. The road was very dusty, and, as I have said, the weather hot, and Snap was very thirsty. No water was met with until Honeslow had been passed. At last a woman crossed the road with a bucket of water, which he had drawn from a neighboring pump. On arriving at her cottage, she placed it outside her door and left it there. Snap saw it, and lapped up some of the water with evident satisfaction, his master waiting for him. When he had finished his lapping, instead of following, he deliberately inserted his hindquarters into the bucket, took a good cooling bath, shook himself in the bucket, jumped out, gave himself another shake, and then followed his master. If Snap was lost in London, he would go to every house usually frequented by his master, and if he then could not find him, would return home. Snap, in fact, was an extraordinary dog. 
One night a gentleman, between fifty and sixty years of age, went into a house of a particular description near the Admiralty. He had not long been there when he died suddenly. He had with him a small dog of the terrier kind, which immediately left the room. There was nothing found on the gentleman's person to lead to a discovery of his name or residence. About twelve o'clock, however, on the following night, three interesting young ladies of very genteel appearance between the ages of sixteen and twenty arrived at the house in which the gentleman died, accompanied by the dog. They came in a chaise from Richmond. It appears that the dog, immediately after the decease of his master, ran off to Richmond, where he usually resided. As soon as the door opened, he rushed into the apartment of the young ladies, who were in the act of dressing themselves. He began to solicit their attention by whines and cries, and his eyes turned to the door, as if to invite them to follow him. Failing in this, he became more earnest, seized their clothes, and pulled them towards the door with so much violence that one of the gowns was torn. This excited great alarm, and from the intelligence shown by the animal, it was resolved by the young ladies to resign themselves to the dog, which continued to entice them away. A chaise was accordingly ordered, and they immediately took their seats in it. The dog led the way with its head almost constantly turned back, and his eyes fixed upon the carriage, until he led them to the house near the Admiralty, where his master had died. There they alighted, but how great was their grief, horror, and surprise, to find their father dead in such a situation. The deceased proved to be Mr. Jones, an inhabitant of Lewisham in Kent, where he possessed a farm of considerable extent, and followed the business of an auctioneer, and was greatly respected in his neighborhood. That night he dropped down in the house alluded to, when the people, supposing him dead, immediately gave the alarm, and the body was conveyed to the Lord Cochrane Hotel within a few doors in Spring Gardens. Here it was discovered that the spark of life was not totally extinguished. He was carried upstairs and put to bed, and medical assistance was called in, but in vain. In a few minutes he was a corpse. As the people of the house were carrying him upstairs, a sum of eleven hundred pounds fell from his pocket in banknotes, tied up in a bundle, and marked on the outside to be paid into snows, a circumstance sufficient in itself to show that he had not been dishonestly treated by the female who accompanied him into the house from which he was brought or any other person belonging to it. The interesting little dog, after his return, remained at his post, the faithful guardian of his beloved master's remains. He lay on the foot of the bed, with his eyes constantly fixed on the body, with an eager, anxious, melancholy expression. The place was crowded with people, led by curiosity to this interesting scene. The dog, never appeared to take any notice of these strange visitors, and no rude hand attempted to interrupt the little mourner in his melancholy office. The verdict of the coroner's inquest was, died by the visitation of God. Another of the same breed of dogs evinced much sagacity on the following occasion. His master occupied furnished lodgings near the inns of court in London. In the hurry of removing from them, neither he nor his servants thought of the dog, who was not in the way when they quitted the house. When the dog returned to it, finding his master gone, he trotted off to Kensington, where an intimate friend of his master resided, and very quietly and patiently made himself at home in the house. As he was well known, he was fed and taken care of, and at the end of three days his master called, and he then gladly went away with him. In this instance it is, I think, evident that the dog possessed a sort of reasoning faculty, which induced him to suppose that the best chance he had of finding his master was by going to a place to which he had formerly accompanied him, and he was correct in his calculation. This faculty was again exercised in the following manner. A gentleman, residing in the Tower of London, had a terrier which he one day lost about seven miles from town. 
The dog attached himself to a soldier, and notwithstanding, the man went to town in an omnibus. The dog followed the vehicle. When the soldier alighted from it, he went to the barracks in St. James Park, the dog continuing close behind him. On examining the collar, the name and residence of the owner of the dog were found on it. The soldier, therefore, brought him to the tower and gave the above particulars. From this account it may be supposed that the dog, having been familiar with the sight of the guardsman at the tower, had followed one of them in hopes that he belonged to that place, and therefore would conduct him to it. I am not aware that any writer upon dogs has noticed one of their peculiarities, that of curiosity. Let me give a curious and well-authenticated instance of this property, which was communicated to me by the owner of the dog. This animal was a Scotch terrier named Snob, and certainly a more singular dog has seldom been met with. His master was commander of the fleet on the South American station, and Snob embarked with him. He soon began to give proofs of his extraordinary curiosity, for he liked to see everything that was going forward in the ship. Snob, in fact, was a sort of Paul Pry. He watched everything that was to be done. One night the sailors were kept up aloft, for some hours, doing something to the sails. Snob remained on the deck the whole time, looking very wise, and watching the sailors with one paw lifted up. He would, at other times, wander between the decks, looking at everything going forward, and when he had been shut in the cabin, he has frequently been observed standing on his hind legs, looking through the keyhole of the door, in order to watch the proceedings which were carried on. I have a great respect for Snob, who is still alive, and I have no doubt his curiosity is as great as ever. A curious instance of ferocity and affection in a terrier bitch is recorded by Mr. Daniel. After a very severe burst of upwards of an hour, a fox was, by Mr. Daniel's hounds, run to earth at Henny Dove House, near Sudbury, in Suffolk. The terriers were lost, but as the fox went to ground in view of the headmost hounds, it was the concluding day of the season, it was resolved to dig him out and two men from Sudbury brought a couple of terriers for that purpose. After considerable labor, the hunted fox was got and given to the hounds. Whilst they were breaking him, one of the terriers slipped back into the earth and again laid. After more digging, a bitch fox was taken out, and the terrier killed two cubs in the earth. Three others were saved from her fury and which were begged by the owner of the bitch, who said he would make her suckle them. This was laughed at as impossible. However, the man was positive, and the cubs were given to him. The bitch fox was carried away and turned into an earth in another county. The terrier had behaved so well at earth that she was some days afterwards bought with the cubs she had fostered by Mr. Daniel. The bitch continued regularly to suckle, and reared them until able to shift for themselves. What adds to this singularity is that the terrier's whelp was nearly five weeks old, and the cubs could just see when this exchange of progeny was made. The following is a proof not only of the kind disposition, but the sense of a terrier. A gentleman, from whom I received the anecdote, was walking one day along a road in Lancashire when he was accosted, if the term may be used, by a terrier dog. The animal's gesticulations were at first so strange and unusual that he felt inclined to get out of its way. The dog, however, at last, by various significant signs and expressive looks, made his meaning known, and the gentleman, to the dog's great delight, turned and followed him for a few hundred yards. He was led to the banks of a canal, which he had not before seen and there he discovered a small dog struggling in the water for his life, and nearly exhausted by his efforts to save himself from drowning. The sides of the canal were bricked with a low parapet wall rather higher than the bank. The gentleman, by stooping down with some difficulty, got hold of the dog and drew him out, his companion all the time watching the proceedings. It cannot be doubted, but that in this instance 
the terrier made use of the only means in his power to save the other dog, and this in a way which showed a power of reasoning equally strong with that of a human being under a similar circumstance. I may here mention another instance of a terrier finding his way back to his former home. A gentleman, residing near York, went to London, and on his return brought with him a young terrier dog which had never been out of London. He brought him to York in one of the coaches, and thence conveyed him to his residence. Impatient of separation from his former master, he took the first opportunity of escaping from the stable in which he had been confined, and was seen running on the turnpike road toward York by the boy who had him in charge, and who followed him for some distance. A few days afterwards, the gentleman who had lost the dog received a letter from London acquainting him that the dog was found lying at the door of his lodgings, his feet quite sore, and in a most emaciated condition. A few years ago, a blind terrier dog was brought from Cashiobury Park, near Watford, to Windsor. On arriving at the latter place he became very restless, and he took the first opportunity of making his escape, and, blind as he was, made his way back to Cashiobury Park, his native place. A correspondent informs me that whilst he was taking a walk one summer's evening, he observed two rough-looking men having a bulldog with them, annoying a sickly-looking young gentleman who was accompanied by a terrier. The bulldog at last seized the latter and would soon have killed it, had not my correspondent interfered. He was then informed that a few years previous, when his master was in bed, this little terrier came to his bedroom door and scratched and yelled to be admitted. When this had been done, he immediately rushed to a closet door in the room, at which he barked most furiously. His master, becoming alarmed, fastened the door, and having obtained the assistance of his servants, a notorious thief was discovered in the closet. Mr. White of Selborne relates a pleasing anecdote of affection which existed between two incongruous animals, a horse and a hen, which showed a mutual fellowship and kindness for each other. The following anecdote, communicated to me by a clergyman in Devonshire, affords another proof of affection between two animals of opposite natures. I will give it in his own words. Some few months since it was necessary to confine our little terrier bitch on account of distemper, the prison door was constructed of open bars, and shortly after the dog was placed in durance, we observed a bantam cock, gazing compassionately at the melancholy inmate, who, doubtless, sadly missed its warm rug by the parlour fire. At last the bantam contrived to squeeze through the bars, and a friendship of a most unusual kind commenced. Pylades and Orestes, Nisus and Euralis could not have been bound by closer bonds of affection. The bantam scarcely forsook the poor prisoner's cell for its daily food, and when it did, the dog became uneasy, whining till her friend returned, and then it was most amusing to watch the actions of the biped and quadruped. As the dog became worse, so did the bantam's attentions redouble, and by way of warming the dog, it took its place between the forelegs and then the little animal settled luxuriously down on the bird, seeming to enjoy the warmth imparted by the feathers. In this position, and nestled closely side by side, did this curious pair pass some weeks, till death put an end to the poor dog and this singular friendship. It must be added, for the bantam's honour, that he was most melancholy for some time afterwards. The same clergyman also communicated to me the following anecdote, illustrative of the sagacity of terriers. He says that his brother-in-law, who has a house in Woburn Place and another in the city, had a wire-haired terrier named Bob of extraordinary sagacity. The dog's knowledge of London and his adventures would form a little history. His master was in the habit occasionally of spending a few days at Gravesend but did not always take his dog with him. Bob, left behind one day against his liking, 
scampered off to london bridge and out of the numerous steamers boarded the gravesend boat disembarked at that place went to the accustomed inn and not finding his master there got on board the steamer again and returned to town he then called at several places usually frequented by his master and afterwards went home to woburn place he has frequently been stolen but always returns sometimes in sad plight with a broken cord round his neck and with signs of ill usage but still he contrives to escape from the dog stealers i once took a favorite terrier with me to a house i had hired in manchester street he had never been in london before while the carriage was unloading in which the dog had been conveyed he was missed and i could hear nothing of him for nearly a fortnight at the end of that time he found his way back to the house with a short cord round his neck which he had evidently gnawed off how he came to find his way back is not a little be wondered at his joy on seeing me again i cannot forget poor peter when he got old and my rides became too long for him he pretended to be lame after accompanying me a short distance and would then trot back without any appearance of lameness the following anecdote proves the kind disposition of a terrier a kitten only a few hours old had been put into a pail of water in the stable yard of an inn for the purpose of drowning it it had remained there for a minute or two until it was to all appearances dead when a terrier bitch attached to the stables took the kitten from the water and carried it off in her mouth she suckled and watched over it with great care and it throve well the dog was at the same time suckling a puppy about ten weeks old but which did not seem at all displeased with the intruder i had once an opportunity of witnessing the sense of a terrier i was riding on sunbury common where many roads diverge when a terrier ran up evidently in pursuit of his master on arriving at one of the three roads he put his nose to the ground and snuffed along it he then went to the second and did the same but when he came to the third he ran along it as fast as he could without once putting down his nose to the ground this fact has been noticed by others but i never before witnessed it myself at dunrobin castle in sutherlandshire then the seat of the marquis of stafford now of the duke of sutherland there was to be seen in may of eighteen twenty a terrier bitch nursing a brood of ducklings she had a litter of whelps a few weeks before which were taken from her and drowned the unfortunate mother was quite disconsolate till she perceived the brood of ducklings which she immediately seized and carried to her lair where she retained them following them in and out with the greatest care and nursing them after her own fashion with the most affectionate anxiety when the ducklings following their natural instinct went into the water their foster mother exhibited the utmost alarm and as soon as they returned to land she snatched them up in her mouth and ran home with them what adds to the singularity of this circumstance is that the same animal when deprived of a litter of puppies the year preceding seized two cock chickens which she reared with a like care she bestows upon her present family when the young cocks began to try their voices their foster mother was as much annoyed as she now seems to be by the swimming of the ducklings and never failed to repress their attempts at crowing the foreman of a brickmaker at earth in kent went from home in company with his wife and left her at the plough at north end with his brother while he proceeded across the fields to inspect some repairs at a cottage in about an hour after his departure his dog a small scotch terrier which had accompanied him returned to the plough jumped into the lap of his mistress pawed her about and whined piteously she at first took no particular notice of the animal but pushed him from her he then caught hold of her clothes pulled at them repeatedly and continued to whine incessantly he endeavored also in a similar way to attract the attention of the brother at last all present noticed his importunate anxiety and the wife then said she was convinced something had happened to her husband the brother and the wife with several others went out and followed the dog who led them through the darkness of the night which was very great to the top of a precipice 
nearly fifty feet deep, and standing on the bank, he held his head over and howled in a most distressing manner. They were convinced that the poor man had fallen over, and having gone round to the bottom of the pit, they found him, lying under the spot indicated by the dog, quite dead. The following anecdote is copied from a recent number of The Field. I well remember when a boy at Barton upon Humber, a certain keel employed in the Yorkshire corn trade on board, which the captain had a dog, possessed of some traces of terrier blood, smooth coated and of a pure white color, his neck and back adorned with stumpy bristles, which ruffled up at the slightest provocation. Altogether, he looked a mongrel cur enough, but he was an excellent sailor for he attended his master on all of his trading expeditions, and never deserted his ship. One day, while the keel lay in Barton Haven, the dog was lost, and great was the consternation in consequence. Diligent search was made in the town and neighborhood, but every effort to discover the missing animal proved unavailing. Month after month passed away. The keel went and came on her accustomed avocations, and poor keeper was forgotten considered by his master to be dead judge therefore the man's surprise when one day steering with difficulty his vessel into ghoul harbor which was crowded with shipping at the time his glance suddenly fell upon his faithful and long lost dog buffeting the water at a considerable distance from the keel but making eagerly toward her by the aid of a piece of tar rope which was dangling round the dog's neck and a friendly boat hook, he was lifted quite exhausted on to the deck of his master's craft, when it became all at once apparent that he had long been kept a prisoner, most probably on board a vessel, by some one who had stolen him at Barton. The cause of the poor dog's sudden reappearance was undoubtedly his having heard his master's well-remembered voice but it is strange he should have been able to distinguish at so great a distance and when swelling that chorus of hoarse bawling which arises from a hundred husky throats when a yorkshire keelman is engaged forcing his craft into a crowded harbour and it is also equally touching that when roused by the distant sound the poor beast should have plunged encumbered as he was with the rope he had just burst asunder so gallantly into the water an element he was ill adapted to move in and in which his master declared he had never seen him before. End of chapter 16